Metal Gear Survive is a game that exists and I think we should leave it at that. But if you're like me and have a, not fetish per se, but a penchant for suffering, then you may want to dive a little deeper. For those who don't know why this game is as controversial as it is, let me give you a brief breakdown. In the mid to late 1980s, a man by the name of Hideo Kojima had one very standard, but also one very important thought. Wouldn't it be fucked up if a little guy had to fight a big robot? And before we knew it, all of this happened. And it's difficult to quickly summarize the impact that the Metal Gear series, and more specifically, the Metal Gear Solid series, had on video games as a medium. Within its own genre of stealth games, it completely overshadowed the simulation-like gameplay of other iconic games such as Thief, with its fast-paced and action-heavy elements that didn't sacrifice player agency like so many other linear games do. Each of the Metal Gear Solid games supported so many different playstyles, and not only allowed, but encouraged players to experiment with all of the strange and obscure additional little mechanics that made each of these games feel like such whole and cared for products. Even the ones that weren't particularly whole or cared for. As for the narratives of the games, they somehow melded being inherently incredibly political while not being all that divisive and while also maintaining this consistently absurd tone that Kojima thrives in. The games had some incredibly dark material within them and somehow didn't falter in their strength when throwing in jokes and fourth wall breaks. And don't get me started on the pure scope of the narratives in play which were purposefully made so large and complex that they would intentionally confuse the players without alienating them in order to support the whole conspiracy vibe of each game. Then there are the masterfully emulated Hollywood inspirations that each game follows, be it the shadowy espionage of 90s spy films in Metal Gear Solid 1, to the turn of the century sci-fi conspiracy trend of Metal Gear Solid 2, to the absolutely incredible Bond movie pastiche of Metal Gear Solid 3, and so on. Then there is the near incomparably iconic cast of characters and voice actors that still have mainstream relevance despite most of the characters not even being seen since 2010 and before. And I could go on, but none of these reasons are why Metal Gear Survive is controversial. It's controversial because it was released after the leading voice behind the Metal Gear series, Kojima, departed on pretty nasty terms from publisher Konami, leaving behind the rights to the series as he went. And unlike the cinematic single-player narrative action stealth titans that were the games that preceded it, Survive is a... zombie game. A zombie survival game. A zombie survival game that is a live service, server-based, always online kind of deal with an emphasis on grinding and multiplayer play which is a little bit of a change of pace, to say the least. To be fair, it could have been none of these bad things, and it would still be controversial as it was made without the direction, or at least the approval, of Kojima. But this shit definitely didn't help! Oh, and just as a bonus point of complete public disdain for this product, Kojima was also working on a revival to the Silent Hill series while at Konami, with aid from the legendary film director Guillermo del Toro. In fact, they produced a playable teaser for their upcoming game in the form of P.T. in 2014. You know, P.T.? The demo for a cancelled game that completely rewrote the metaphor and has utterly dominated the horror game space for most of the last decade by inspiring the likes of the Resident Evil renaissance, every Bloober Team game, Visage, and 80% of indie horror, while also acting as a pioneer for the liminal space horror trend which is only now finding its mainstream popularity? Yeah. That game. Well, Metal Gear Survive replaced that and the greater Silent Hill reboot as the primary source of horror-aligned media from Konami and its proprietary Fox engine. And again, it's a zombie survival game. A genre which, by the time of the game's 2018 release, was so deeply oversaturated. So yes, in the court of public opinion, it was going to be a difficult task to make this game anything other than completely vilified. So, um... Let's start it up. I love starting up a game and being reminded that I can only play it for as long as they maintain their servers, but luckily for us, we get to choose the mortal server that we will be eternally bound to until they turn it off. How fun! Naturally, I picked the elusive Other Europe. If I'm being forced into a games-as-a-service model, then I'm at least doing it on my own mysterious terms. When I started the game, one thing that I was surprised to see was just how similar it initially appears to Metal Gear Solid V. It has the same assets and whatnot, which is kind of, whatever, a little on the lazy side, but it's on the same engine and they're trying to tie it into the story of Metal Gear Solid V, so I can't really complain too much. One thing that I love so far is that they've kept the wonderful handheld camera shots for Metal Gear Solid V as well. They go on for a really long time and actually act like real camera movements for the most part. 
I mean, this is almost certainly just a relic of Kojima's involvement in the last games, but it's neat to see this style being used again. It's a great way of exploring the space and giving presence to the spectator in a way that most game cutscenes really lack. Narratively, we're put in the space between Metal Gear Solid V Ground Zeroes and Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain. Yeah, there were two Metal Gear Solid Vs in case you'd forgotten. And in those games, our protagonist has his favorite oil rig blown up and all of his best boys annihilated, and it's all, it's all very upsetting especially considering the fact that we are one of the annihilated best boys. And after being killed, we get to make our character. And naturally, I got very creative. I was gonna be all silly for the video and call him, like, Keith Metal Gear or something stupid like that, but I figured I can do better. Meet John Metal Gear. He's very polite. And now a man is defiling his corpse. And now he's being sent to hell to fight the undead. I... I feel like we're missing some critical information. For those unaware, Metal Gear hasn't had a tremendous amount of zombies or hell in it in the past, so this turn of events is a little strange, but, you know, I'll take it. Two very intense men explain that John Metal Gear is a very special boy with some kind of infection that allows him to regenerate tissue and is therefore perfectly fit to go to hell, where the tissue market is crumbling. One huge narrative green flag that I ran into early on was a mention of the Philadelphia Experiment. The Philadelphia Experiment was a fictional test by the US military to find out if they could do funky stuff to boats, like make them invisible because, you know, that's just, that's just cool. But the boat they use ends up teleporting around and the folk inside of it get fused to the metal and whatnot in horrible ways and it's all very inconvenient. This is how they explain us being pulled into a giant wormhole that drags us to hell. The two are somehow connected. Also, shout out to Snake, who, despite having all of his boys just killed and his main base of operations annihilated, didn't even do a double take when escaping to notice an enormous portal sucking up what remains of his friends. Anyway, the reason the whole Philadelphia experiment mention is a green flag to me is because Metal Gear has, on several occasions, taken real or speculative historical events and used them in its own narrative, and this is just a continuation of that trend. However, it's also a red flag, because we're teleporting to hell. Now, the Metal Gear games are kind of batshit insane as it is. Giant mechs, nanomachines, the entirety of Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, and many other notable oddities exist as core parts of the lore. But this feels like jumping the shark. There exists a line in my brain somewhere between Metal Gear Rising and Metal Gear Survive, which separates one as being completely acceptable and the other as being utterly absurd, and I can't quite tell you where that line is. Anyway, once we're in hell, we meet our main antagonists, the Wanderers. They're just zombies with geodes baked into their skulls. I mean, there is more to them, but I don't really care to explain, just like the game doesn't really care to explain either. Once we're into the gameplay itself, I'm afraid to say that the performance is absolutely abysmal. If you're wondering why this video is in 30 frames per second rather than 60 frames per second like most of the others on this channel, it's because I'd much rather show you a consistent 30 than an inconsistent 60, which this game is rife with. And that's a real shame because Metal Gear Solid V ran beautifully on my PC, at least the PC that I actually recorded this gameplay on, I since broke that one, that's a whole story. Um, anyway, yeah, Metal Gear Solid V ran beautifully on that PC and was one of the best looking and performing games I've ever played. But here it's chugging all the time and there's this weird fuzz around everything like we're in some kind of furry train and I'm just, I'm not here for it. Anyway, our main objective is to collect stuff and save people. It may sound like I'm oversimplifying it, because I am, but they explain it in the same verbose way every other Metal Gear game does with its objectives and lore, except in this one, they're not actually saying anything. At least in the others, there was a lot of character in the dialogue, and it was clear that there was a strong narrative to follow. But in this one, you can tell from the get-go that they just want to push you out into the world and have you inconvenience some rock zombies. And yes, as I said earlier, this is a survival game. There's crafting and hunger and thirst and strict stamina limits and... Ugh. What else is there to say about that? I don't know if this is a hot take in the year of our Lord 2023, in the script I originally wrote 2022, that should tell you how long I've been working on this. But these things are just plain annoying if the game isn't explicitly built around them. Oh, you wanna go kill some zombies? That's cool, but are you hydrated enough? You wanna crouch for a while? Make sure you neck that goat milk before you go on, or we will yell at you. 
This is also one of those games which has incredibly lengthy, unskippable menu tutorials, and with my incredible luck, I managed to get a network error, which kicks you out of the game, when putting on a funny hat before the game was able to autosave. So I had to sit through all of those menu tutorials twice, and even remembering this makes me feel like there are ants in my skin, and not in a good way. Also, when I got that error, I had to restart, and I was greeted with one of the ugliest screens I have seen in a game since at least 2006, so kudos on making this revolting piece of eye trash. Despite the endless tutorials, the game itself is trivially easy at the start. Watch me get caught in a big chase scene. They're certainly trying their best. I mean, I'd do no better if I had a rock where my brain should be, but this doesn't make me feel very sportsmanly. Unlike the animals that you have to hunt for food, you can sneak up on them, shoot them from afar, run and hope you can ready your weapon in time to attack them before they flee, or... Alternatively, you can do this. You can punch them so hard that they pass out, and then you warp them into the meat dimension. This is absolutely my favorite part of this game, without question. Where do they go? Why do I receive their materials? To be honest, I think the real meat industry works in a worryingly similar way. But yes, the actual enemies, the non-animal enemies, are stupid as hell and very easy to either run away from, or just kind of trick using geometry. That is, until the defense missions appear. They kind of thrust them on you, unlike everything else so far, which has had extensive and largely unnecessary tutorials. And the first time I encountered one, I foolishly forgot to pack my six steel wire fences which I have since learned are the single greatest defensive inventions of the human epoch, and I was forced to watch as dozens of lads stumbled towards this teleporter thing and destroyed it. These defense missions seem to be the bread and butter of the game as well. I'm both disappointed and glad about this. Glad because I won't spend the entire time just running away from things, and disappointed because I actually have to play the game. On more than one occasion, I was thrown into one of these defense missions without being given much more warning than do X when you're ready which could have meant a dozen different things, but no, apparently my base is now being assaulted by wormholes full of zombie war criminals. And once I try again after placing the holy wire fences, my base has a very strange and sinister vibe to it. Even stranger when the zombies start coming again, I, I feel very guilty about this and I don't know exactly why. But yeah, these defense missions are... long. Having to defend something for six minutes doesn't sound like a long time, but that's a very context-heavy amount of time. Six minutes of this video would have felt like an eternity to some, and to others, you know, smaller eternities. Six minutes in the context of Metal Gear Survive is pretty hefty indeed. And one thing I love in any kind of defense or escort mission is when you have to successfully defend something for a lengthy amount of time, only for some narrative act of God to fuck things up completely and make your attempts utterly redundant. <sighs> What's that? Your thing exploded at 5 minutes and 59 seconds? That's despicable! It was meant to explode at 6 minutes and 3 seconds after a brief cutscene. <sighs> At least I can take out my frustration on some donkeys. Why are the donkeys in hell? Anyway, as we progress, we are sent further and further into this nethery fog world that the game refers to as the dust, which is basically like the Silent Hill Otherworld if you needed any more salt rubbed into that already grossly over-seasoned wound. On paper, I really like the dust areas. It's reminding me of the abyss areas from Dark Souls where everything is bleak and empty, but at the same time full of this foreboding meaning. Except in this one it lacks the meaning, so it just feels bleak and empty. In general, I've got a complex relationship with anything that restricts player view. Sometimes, it's really cool. Most of the time, it fucking sucks. I'll let you decide which side of the spectrum this game falls into. A lot of the time, the game uses this endless fog to hide the fact that it has shamelessly reused assets from Metal Gear Solid V, but again, whatever, I'm not too bothered by that. As long as they aren't needlessly reusing exact maps and whatnot, then I'm not too bothered. There's bigger fish to fry. Why is there a whole lot of Afghan architecture, much like the stuff you'd find in Metal Gear Solid V in hell? Who knows? It's zombie time. While walking through the dust, you'll occasionally, and I do mean occasionally, find vehicles that can be used, and honestly, they are an absolute blast. They make the dust feel like, well, not shit, as you can zoom through the world and see much more of the reused Metal Gear Solid V landscapes than you could when relying solely on your squishy yet delectable human limbs. Also, check out this walker gear. I 
love him. This is a rare example of fun. But this game is, well, this game. And it must remind us that having nice things is an utter impossibility, as the vehicles all break or otherwise degrade incredibly quickly. Plus, throughout the entire game, I found a grand total of about three vehicles. So putting them in here at all was a choice, for sure, and a very cruel one at that. It's not every day a game blatantly showcases its own lost potential as hard as this one does. I really felt the scarcity of vehicles when I had one mission that made me cross the entire map to rescue some guy, which I successfully did, but I failed to activate the fast travel point right next to him. So I had to go back to the main base, leave the guy I was meant to save behind, and then travel back again because otherwise I would have to carry him all the way through the dust where he'd probably die. Oh, and when I got there, the game disconnected from the servers again and I lost all of the progress. And Steam couldn't sync my save file with the cloud. Remember folks, games as a service is the future. It's just a shame the future ended in 2023. Oh, also, having to do this part completely over again gave me ample opportunity to find this entire village area that was ripped straight from Metal Gear Solid V and planted here without any real changes. So, yeah, they are just verbatim reusing the maps. Great. Okay, let's take a quick break and look for some positives. I had one genuinely brilliant moment while doing one of the many, many defense missions where I could, very vaguely in the distance, hear a thudding. A thudding that got progressively more intense to the point where I was convinced I was going to see an enormous monster or some other flavor of big foe. At the end of that defense section, I found out what it was. It was nothing. Still a cool moment though. Also, kind of out of nowhere, all of the NPCs start talking as if we're at the end of the game. They're all saying we're about to head home and we're going to have to make one grand last stand as we power up the plot device or whatever. The game then utterly terrifies me because, for whatever reason, expanding the base to add more defenses and resources triggers the cutscene that teases the final defense before you've had a chance to prepare for it. It did this when I had nothing set up and the only working armament between myself and everyone else in the base was a single spear. But it turns out to be nothing other than a really strangely placed plot point that doesn't lead to anything. But this intended scare freaked me out so much, to the point where I wanted to go and do something less stressful for a while. I go and fight a bear. It ends in a Pyrrhic victory. Realizing that, much like in real life, the combination of a misleading cutscene and a single bear was almost enough to unravel all of the work that I've done, I thought it'd be best to stock up on supplies. And according to the internet, the best place to get materials in this game is in the multiplayer mode. Now, before we get to the multiplayer section of the video, I'd like to jump to our sponsor, which is a new thing for this. Um, and that sponsor is me. Hello. As some of you will know, I've started streaming fairly regularly on twitch.tv forward slash paintkiss. Uh, we're currently in the playthrough of a very heavily modded Elder Scrolls for Oblivion game, which is... It's, it's been something so far, and we've also just wrapped up playing the new Dead Space remake. The VODs for which are all available on my second channel, Paintskiss Archive, and yes, thank you. Oh, also, on Twitch, um, I, use a, I use a face cam, which is big news. So to quote one of my favorite people, If you're curious about what I look like in real life, head over to twitch.tv forward slash Paintskiss and hit the follow button to find out. If any real sponsors wanna wanna jump in here, they can. I uh, I do need the money. Oh, look at our patriotic boy. Where the fuck are we? Did they just forget to add a co-op zone, so they left us in the Assassin's Creed loading screens? Uh, whatever. Let's queue up for a match. By the way, I'm very upset that I don't show up as John Metal Gear in the lobby. It, uh, doesn't exactly feel like this game is popping with the EU kids anymore. They must have jumped over to a newer, more popular game like... Halo Infinite. In the lobby screen, there's a timer which put a little pressure on me to find a game, but I stopped worrying when that timer actually ran out and another, slightly more desperate timer began. Finding nobody to play with was a very sad experience. 
I was fully hoping to run into that digital cryptid that exists on every single multiplayer game. You know, the one that's been playing since day one and is super welcoming to all new players and is utterly convinced that this game is the best one ever made? Every game has one of those. But Metal Gear Survive may be the exception. The second desperate timer runs out, and then a third, more jaded one begins. Then it just sort of asks me to give up and start a multiplayer match by myself. I refuse. Look, the Steam charts say there are over 100 concurrent players. There must be thousands of matches out there. Maybe it's because I'm playing at 2am and Europe is asleep, so why don't we hop over to the US servers instead? America always provides. America did not provide. I give in and launch it solo instead. To nobody's surprise, it's another defend the X thing for Y amount of time kind of mode. But it's allegedly on easy mode, so it can't be too bad. And you know what? I wrote that bit about it being easy as a joke because I was fully expecting to get stomped, but it was actually okay. And, uh, kind of fun. Who knew playing this game with substantially more visibility would be an improvement? I end up being able to extract from the mission before I get overwhelmed, and end up with a C rank and some items to play around with, which are, surprise surprise, substantially better than the items I got in single player. Who'd have thought? I launch another solo game with a different objective where you have to escort an injured fella through a thing and he's very slow and it's very tricky and whatnot, but I find it hard to write about this game mode for one specific reason. I got a little bit distracted during it. What distracted me? Huh. <laughs> a silly little question. What the fuck is that? What is this game? Why isn't this guy in single player? I've been fighting the same enemy type for the entire thing, sans some spiders and pigeons, but other than that, it's been dickhead zombies. Miraculously, when queuing up again, I actually find another player who shares my exact level and player card. You can tell I was surprised, because in the footage I was watching the trailer for Stalker 2 and it took me a while to realize I was no longer alone. When we start playing, something magical happens. We make less progress than I did playing solo, but nonetheless, it was fun playing, even with cross-Atlantic ping. From the footage here, you can see that the multiplayer, at least at this low level, is a bit samey, but the looming threat of going back to the substantially worse single player was enough to keep me trying it. But unfortunately, despite my best efforts, my new friend left me. Or the game kicked us. Or I disconnected. Regardless, I'm sorry, drag free. I'm sorry that I wasn't enough. Holy fuck, I found two more players. This guy's even called YouTube. It was meant to be. I got so excited at these potential new friends that I alt tabbed a little too quickly and the game crashed. I tried queuing into them again, but unfortunately, YouTube is nowhere to be found. What is this, Painticus 2022? Thankfully, this started me on a streak of actually queuing into more and more players. Like this guy who carries me so hard that I actually lose any sense of what's happening. All I know is that he kills zombies and I get goodies. And check this out. S rank, baby. I'm the goatest of the greats. And now I'm queuing into games with people who actually speak. This game fucking rules. I'm not even saying that ironically. When in full lobbies, this game is actually super fun. It's not Metal Gear by any regard. It's some strange co-op tower defense shit. It does kind of feel like I'm playing Dungeon Defenders with a load of mods, but that's okay by me. I liked Dungeon Defenders. Unlike the single player, which does try to take itself seriously, the multiplayer goes absolutely bananas. You can do stuff like summon the Shagohod, the WMD antagonist mech thing from Metal Gear Solid 3, to kill zombies for you, which is just insanity. And the rewards you get from higher difficulty games are utterly overpowered compared to the meager and incredibly limited single player offerings. Plus the multiplayer runs significantly better than the single player stuff too. I was foolish and forgot to record these parts at 60 frames per second, so I apologize for that. But trust me when I say that it was running smoothly at that frame rate, which makes it all the more pitiful that I have to go back to the single player eventually. Once again, it's not every day a game blatantly showcases its own lost potential as hard as this one does. Now stocked up with an absurd amount of items, it's time to go back. Now that I've got everything set up for the big conclusion, let's see what kind of spectacle this game has to offer us in its final moments. 
Okay, I think I overcooked this defense. Okay, maybe to an absurd degree. We win without the zombies ever getting close to a single hit on the defense target. The mission kind of fizzles out without any concern. Now is an important time to introduce the game's main antagonist, who I failed to mention so far. Not because it's not a notable character, but because I didn't really know when to introduce it before. Have you seen the film The Mist? The film based on the Stephen King novel? You know the enormous creature from that? Yeah, that's the antagonist from this game. Let me introduce you to the impeccably named Lord of Dust. What in the Resident Evil Dark Souls HP Lovecraft fuck is that? I don't know, but I do like his vibe. Remember that stomping around I heard earlier and got all excited about? I reckon it was this guy. Anyway, he shows up and starts doing his thing, and his thing is... well... spitting. And what follows is not a boss fight, but instead a frustrating series of mind-numbing cutscenes where our character, John Metal Gear, despite being pursued by an invincible eldritch abomination while carrying a disabled child, just kinda stands around looking inconvenienced while absolutely everything goes to shit. Classic John Metal Gear. But eventually, he fumbles his way through a short gauntlet and reaches a wormhole so he can go home. Yahoo! We did it. Oh. It's not over. Of course. Now we're in a greener place which is, naturally, another location taken straight from Metal Gear Solid 5 as well. The two locations in this game are literal excerpts from the locations in Metal Gear Solid 5, but with a disgusting fog covering the whole thing and with most of the cool stuff completely inaccessible. This new hub area, is even an exact copy of Metal Gear Solid 5's more memorable parts, but without a fun pool to play with. I was fully ready to give up on the game at this point, and it's only because I wanted to see how much of Metal Gear Solid 5 they directly ripped for this that I continued on. But honestly, the game is way better suited to the Central African environment that this location offers. Everything is much tighter, the visuals are less grey and dull, and they add new enemy types, and they give you access to better weapons. Am I saying it's good? No. It feels more that they stumbled accidentally onto a good map choice here, plus you still have to sit through the Afghanistan stage, and that's not good, not even remotely. But now I can annihilate some zebras with my fists. Plus, this incredible scene where we accidentally drop a guy. We also get introduced to a new villain to replace the Lord of Dust, who I now imagine has to walk from Afghanistan to the Congo. This villain's new name? Almost as mighty as the one that came before him. His name is Dan. Get a better fucking name, good god. And we're told that Dan is either insane or in cahoots with the Lord of Dust and he's allegedly stopping us from reaching some kind of super weapon that can be used to destroy the Lord of Dust and save everyone from the encroaching Silent Hill world and whatnot. So he's got to go, but first we've got to find out what this super weapon actually is. Now this objective actually excited me a bit. For those who don't know, a Metal Gear is a kind of super weapon, and every Metal Gear game has introduced a new kind of Metal Gear or Metal Gear adjacent thing. Metal Gear Solid had Rex, Metal Gear Solid 2 had Ray and Arsenal Gear, Metal Gear Solid 3 had the Shagohod, Metal Gear Solid 4 had the Geckos, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance had fucking loads of shit, Peace Walker had the Peace Walker, and Zeke and Pupa and Chrysalis and Cocoon, Portable Ops had Raxa, MG1 and 2 had Metal Gear 1 and D, Metal Gear Solid 5 had Sahelanthropus. I, I don't know what Metal Gear Acid is, so I can't really talk for those games, but I think you get the gist. And I was a little shocked when I saw what this game decided to have as its Metal Gear stand-in. I'll give you four options to guess from as to what this thing is. A weird Frankenstein-style Metal Gear made from old parts. A Metal Gear that was cut content from another game. The exact Metal Gear from Metal Gear Solid 5 with almost no changes. Or plans for a Metal Gear that we have to build ourselves using collected resources. If you chose A, B, or D, this video has not done enough to shatter your faith in this game, and I apologize. The Metal Gear in Metal Gear Survive is literally the same one for Metal Gear Solid 5 reused. On paper, I don't really mind this because it's actually canon friendly and I do like Sahelanthropus' design, but good god man, is any part of this game original? Well, he is. We like him. 
Admittedly, seeing Sahelanthropus all fucked up and mossy in a river is kind of cool, but not as cool as the zombies behind me that were hunting an okapi. Nature is beautiful. Unfortunately, at this time, the network errors began. So, yes, when I was recording this in the early hours of June 17th, 2022, yes, that long ago, I was having internet issues. And this meant that every so often I would be kicked out of the game and have all of my unsaved progress wiped. When I came to rant about it in my notes, I couldn't because I was taking notes on Google Docs, and that requires a constant internet connection as well. I hate living in the future. Thank God it started to die. Losing progress is bad enough, but when you're playing a game that spends almost all of its time making you sit down for two to six minute defense missions, the looming threat of random network failures became far scarier than anything Konami could ever throw at us. I was able to make it back to Sahelanthropus again, and even save the Okapi while I was at it, and my internet survived just long enough for the dastardly engineer Dan to come and yell at us for a while, and for some reason, Dan yelling at us makes us think that he's a stable enough guy? And he's like, okay now? I, I don't have the mental fortitude to question it, so we just move on. Next up, we have to defend a portal machine that's meant to suck up Sahelanthropus and send it back to our base, which is fine, I suppose. At this point, I've sat through a dozen, if not more, of these two to six minute defense things, so what's one more going to do to me? We begin the mission and... Oh, this is a 15 minute defense mission. We have to defend this thing for a quarter of an hour when my internet has been cutting out the entire time. 15 minutes may not sound like much, but count it out for yourself and picture that time being spent on Metal Gear Survive. Now it's starting to feel like a while, right? So yeah, I'll consider this the game's first boss fight. Not against zombies per se, but against my ISP and the concept of games as a service. And miraculously, on my first attempt, with absolutely no damage to the portal lad, we manage it. I can chalk it up largely to the massively overpowered weapon I got from multiplayer. This little sprinting combo thing that I did wiped out almost all of the enemies, and when I got bored of that, I had enough grenades left to trivialize the rest of it. The only real challenge are these big lads that don't let you insta-kill them and have guns for arms, but again, I learned that a single grenade takes them out, so I got past those pretty easy too. Honestly, I was expecting more trouble from this, but uh, nah, it was okay. Still, 15 minutes of pretty mind-numbing stuff, but hardly the worst thing I've had to do for this game. And our reward for completing this Herculean gauntlet of endurance? Our kid friend gets kidnapped by our mustache friend, and it turns out Dan was the good guy all along. I guess that's what we get for dropping him earlier. I can tell that whoever wrote this game's story out felt that they had to include a lot of twists and depth to the story, of which there is a lot. There's a ton of classic Metal Gear Solid conspiracy stuff, but it's boring as hell compared to the Kojima-era madness that was present through the Metal Gear Solid series. But it must have been hard to do that when you're given the premise of reuse these assets and make a zombie survival game, so my heart kinda goes out to the writers. But I will give them this, they drop a pretty cool chunk of lore in the next dialogue bit. It turns out that this fog, the dust, the zombies, mustache man, pretty much everything, are actually part of a nanomachine hive mind that is effectively turning into a grey goo scenario. If you don't know what a grey goo scenario is, it's a hypothetical global catastrophic scenario involving molecular nanotechnology in which out-of-control self-replicating machines consume all biomass on Earth while building more of themselves. And yes, I just read that straight from the first paragraph of the Wikipedia page. In simpler terms, Hungry robots make more robots until everything dies or turns into robots. Another game that played with this idea is Deus Ex Invisible War, so Metal Gear Survive has some very prestigious peers. So anyway, we go and fucking mark Mustache Boy in what can only be described as a fight, and then we get more lore dumps that tell us that this isn't hell or a different dimension or anything like that, and it's actually the future of the regular world, and that the Lord of Dust has been using wormholes to travel back in time, creating a time loop that allows it to get stronger each time, but now we're turning into one of the zombies and just a, a whole bunch of other shit. Basically, they're trying to make the Metal Gear Solid 5 asset reuse make sense, but in reality, they've just implied that time travel is a thing in the Metal Gear canon now, so that's... Yeah, okay. That might be a step too far, even for Metal Gear. It also suggests that in the future, the only things that are worth seeing just happen to take place in the exact same locations as Metal Gear Solid V, and only the tech for Metal Gear Solid V actually survived, so it's all very convenient. 
Regardless, the Lord of Dust is now coming and we have to do some hell busy work before that's allowed to happen. I won't bore you with more of the same because the last two objectives before the final mission are just the same shit we've done a million times, so let's just skip to the conclusion. With my base now set up as a bizarre maze of wire mesh and farms, we're now ready to begin. Will we survive? Will we get to go home? Will the Lord of Dust die? I don't know and I don't really give a shit. It begins. And let me tell you, this is far and away the best part of the game. All of these terrible defenses I set up, turns out it was completely useless as the game just gives you a huge pre-made set of defenses slightly outside of your base for you to use instead. And now we have some wave-based combat. It's split into three distinct sections, and honestly, it's a blast. Rather than being timed, like the game's previous challenges, this one just wants you to kill everything and they give you the tools to do so. Mortars which are incredibly satisfying, machine guns that mow down crowds, brilliant fence placements that really create a sense of a horde approaching, and during all this, the Lord of Dust is just kinda sat behind you like, no, don't kill me lads, them's me lads, and then we shoot him with a railgun. I had a tremendous amount of fun here. Even if the difficulty was all over the place, one of the sections I fully believe could have had me doing absolutely nothing but watching, because there were these like fire traps that just killed anyone that touched them. But on another one, if I didn't actively kill everything myself, I was completely fucked. Still, an excellent time, and it's such a shame the rest of the game is not like this whatsoever. Using Metal Gear Solid V's versatile combat systems with environmental interactions, tons of different kinds of equipment, and a really cool set piece surrounding it all is fantastic. But instead of that, the rest of the game is us in a foggy place putting up fences and scrounging for materials. Anyway, we, uh, we shoot the Lord of Dust and it, it doesn't work. So uh, <laughs> now he's going to invade Tampa or whatever the hell that is. And it turns out that the Lord of Dust is incapable of dying because, and just get this, it has no understanding of what death is. Which, while nonsensical, is metal as hell. Oh, you don't want to die? Just forget what death is then, idiot. Then there's a, a whole bunch of lore dumped on us while the world is about to end in classic Metal Gear style, I must add, where it's revealed that the kid we've been carrying around for the whole game is actually the past version of the guy that sent John Metal Gear to this place uh, in the very beginning, and that is undoubtedly, without question, a twist. Now, I do have to admit a slight fault on my end. While I have been very good at recording things for this game, I did forget to record a fairly crucial part. That being the game's ending. So the person pictured here is absolutely not John Metal Gear. We can only assume he died quietly off screen, now damned to be forgotten by history. Rest in peace, Mr. Metal Gear. But to summarize what's going on, an AI assistant we've had for the entire game sacrifices itself to teach the Lord of Dust what death means by just flying into him, which is kind of funny, and you're like, okay, chill and then you shoot it and kill both of them, and the game makes it seem like this is a hugely emotional moment, but I do not care in the most remote amount about that computer. All it has done is tell me to remember to eat and breathe and not run too much. Honestly, every time your stamina gets to a certain threshold, it's like, Captain, please remember that you can't have too much fun. So yes, I hold no fondness towards it. And that's where the story ends. The Lord of Dust dies and the game has the gall to play the Peace Walker theme, which is a whole can of worms in itself, and oh, oh good, the AI guy actually survives. Great. But we're still in hell, and there's still dust and zombies around, so in actuality we've achieved a net zero in terms of progress over the entire game, which is... it's poetic, in a way. Now, I usually do a little wrap-up section at the end of these videos where I go over some final points or summarize my feelings, but uh, nah, not today. If I left you with a feeling of this video being a full product or a worthwhile end-to-end -end experience, I would be doing the subject matter injustice. Did you know that Metal Gear Solid 2 Substance had a skateboarding mode? Now that's a good Metal Gear spin-off. I do wish I'd touched the Metal Gear Survive multiplayer when it was popular though. That was genuinely a good time even if it's very repetitive, and I feel like I was only able to scratch the surface of it and that's likely all I'll ever be able to do because god knows how long they're going to keep support for this game going. And perhaps as a bigger concern, who's still going to be playing this game for any extended amount of time in the future? Now, I suppose one question worth asking is, What's more worth your time? This game, or the game that I spoke about, wow, the script says this time last year. It was not this time last year. Fallout 76. That sounds like a strange question, but both came out in the same year as always online multiplayer focused spin-offs to major franchises that nobody asked for. And to answer that question... I hear Metal Gear Solid 2's skateboarding is really good. 
Thanks very much for watching and for being very patient with this video. More videos are coming soon and they're gonna be made much faster than this one for sure, but if you want anything more from me in the meantime, um, like I said earlier, Twitch is a thing I do with a face and whatnot. Uh, and there's also Twitter and Discord if you want to see me struggle to interact like a normal human, and both of those are linked in the description. But, uh, yeah. That's everything. Thank you. I've completely forgotten how to end these videos.